I'm sure uh, you have seen um, young people or children these days. I think I don't want to sound like I'm so old, but when when I was when I was young, when I was young, uh, when I was young, uh, I guess I was so young in what the 90s. So in the 90s, Ireland was still you know relatively. I wouldn't say poor, but we were modest. Modest might be a good word for it. Uh, so, like we, you know, if, if you had toys or things as a young person in 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 those days, uh, that toy had to last quite some time because if it broke, you weren't getting another one. Uh, even like your clothes, even to have like labelled clothes to have like uh, Nike or Adidas or anything like that. Like if you had like runners, you would treat them like they were made from gold. You know what I mean? You would wear them only on special occasions. You'd wash them. You'd you'd, you'd take care of them. You'd never be outside horsing through. Um, manure or gardening in them, you know what I mean? So, I guess Ireland was, was like, uh, it was, yeah, a mo a more modest, okay. Things have moved on, a Celtic Tiger and so on and so forth. And so now you see a lot of young people these days, and they, they may have come here on a treat or things, and they were like, you know, they're, especially when you're kids, like, you, you outgrow things anyway, so they're only going to have them for two or three years before they, before they won't fit. But you have kids here, and sometimes they'll, they'll come here on a treat, and they'll have all the gear, all the labels, and something will rip on a branch, or rip on a tree, or rip on a, a fence somewhere, and they go, oh, it doesn't matter, mom will get me a new one. Right? And you see that this real attitude of kind of easy come, easy go. I got it for free, got torn to shreds, I'll get another one. No problem. As in, mom will get me another one, dad will get me another one. So there's very little sense of, of value to these things. And, and anything you get for free, uh, anything you get so easily, um, generally speaking, we don't appreciate it. Uh, even though I was talking to, to Americans, I was over in America there doing a uh, parish mission there uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, they said, you know, if, if you're putting on a, a mission, uh, don't do it for free. And I said, well, I don't care about money. And they said, yes, but if you, if you don't charge for it, it's treated cheaply. All right, so that's, you don't have to like you know don't don't make millions on it like but but if people get something for free they generally disregard it very easily you know so it's like even college places I mean if college places are just handed out freely well then students will turn up who actually have no intention of working even at a third level institution and and not study for their exams so if the things are given out freely they're treated cheaply okay so the Lord has this. Uh, balance that he has to maintain. He wants to draw everyone to himself, but at the same time, we should have to do something, some sort of a minimum, so that we've, we've chosen to come here, like, rather than just giving it out for free and have people disregard it. So what's this minimum that the Lord expects of us? Well, it's, it, really isn't, it really is not much. It really is not much. Uh, it's that Firstly, that we love him. I think it's fairly, fairly low bar there again, like that we would approach the, the, the Eucharist, that we would approach the altar with some love for the Lord. And that love for him then is, is shown, is proven by the fact that we obey him. So he who loves me will keep my commands. Okay, so it's, it's really simple. It's not, this is not complicated. This is not complicated. And considering what we get, considering what we receive in return, the Lord himself, what he asks us to give is an abs it's pittance, it's, it's, it's a couple of coppers in comparison to what we get in return, okay? So why am I saying this? Um, today is the feast, feast of Saints Peter and Paul. So these two columns of the church, uh, even in, in their day, they, they, were, they were pivotal for the church, but their writings afterwards, we, we continue to draw from them every single day through the liturgy. Uh, in, expressly or implicitly, uh, just the, the, the incre two incredibly important uh, men in the church. And yet both die martyrs. You have this kind of almost contradiction. You know, that they've been blessed by the Lord with uh, an intimate relationship with him, an intimate knowledge of him, and yet they, they shed their blood for him. They, they, they die for him. Why would the Lord allow this? A man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. A man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for God. So they're not just good writers. And it, it may even be that, that Peter might have needed a fair bit of help from his scribe to correct his 
grammar, who knows. Uh, so it's not that they had it all up here, but they most definitely had it all in here. They had, a, a, say, an intimate, intimate knowledge and love for the Lord. They knew him. And even uh, St. Saint, Saint Paul had a, came to know the Lord in a, in a different way, uh, in a more maybe kind of a mystical way, having not been one of his apostles directly. Uh, but n- there's no doubt r- from, from his writings that he knew the Lord. He knew the Lord's heart. So they, they have this, this wonderful uh, experience of God, which they want to share with everyone, even unto death. So we, we draw from, from that today. And something that, that I think is, is, is it's, it's such a simple message in a way, and yet so often we go back to, to the simple messages of our faith. Okay. I was talking to a lady not relatively recently, and she was saying, you know, her, her son doesn't really practice anymore because he'd have an issue with, with God sending people to hell. All right? So you've got, I say, Peter and Paul talking about this, this wonderful God, this, this, this giving God, this loving God, this, 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 the Lord who, who, who dies on the cross for us. And yet at the same time, you have the, the reality of hell. So how do we reconcile this? To get back to the basics of our faith, how can we say God is good if hell exists? You know, there's like really simple, basic questions that are very, very good to ask and, and try and work, work our way through because in all these things, we must preserve the image of God as a good father. We must preserve the image of God as a loving father. So h- how do we do that? How do we reconcile both? Today, uh, in ordinary time, we would have been reading about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, so again, we see this kind of consequence for not living according to, to, to what God asks, this, the consequences of sin, the wages of sin, death. So how do we reconcile this with God being loving, God being good, God being Father, Jesus being our Savior, and yet hell exists? The Catechism, this ingenious little summary of our faith, it expresses it so well. And it's something that it, it, I think it's very, very important for us to know because this will, this will be asked of us. Uh, we might even have this question ourselves. If not, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters uh, will definitely have this, this, this question or this, this perplexity as regards to the goodness of God and yet despite the existence of, of hell. So there's a couple of things that we have to keep an eye on here as regards what the Catechism says about hell. It's in 1033, if you want to read it afterwards yourselves. We cannot be united with God unless we freely choose to love him. Okay? Now, this doesn't say anything about God pointing the finger, condemning and damning anyone. It says, we cannot be united unless we freely choose to love him. Okay, so it's simple enough so, so far. If I don't love God, then why would I want heaven? Why would I want to be with him for all eternity if I don't want to be with him now? If I don't choose to love him now, why would I choose to love him for all eternity? Okay, but we cannot see, but we cannot love God if we sin gravely against him. Again, you know, if your husband says to you, oh, I love you, dearest, you're just my little honey bunch, and I have my little bit on the side as well. <laughs> no, like if you love your wife, then you're faithful to her. You love her and her alone. You can't say you love her and these four other women who are just amazing as well. It just, it just doesn't, we know that that's not what love is. So we cannot love God and sin gravely against him. If, if, surely if I love him, I'll at least try. I'm, it may happen that I fall, but I will try. I will try to do what he asks of me. Okay, so just to skip on a bit. To die in mortal sin without repenting, so, I, so I'm, without repenting, I'm not sorry. Me, again, this is, there's nothing to do with God pointing the finger. Keep in mind, this is, this is all me, my choice. So I die in, the, in, in mortal sin, I do not repent, and I do not accept God's merciful love. Again, accept, it's being offered to me. So God is doing everything he can to keep me from going the wrong direction. He's doing everything he can to save me. 
Okay? But if I die, and I am not sorry, and I refuse God's mercy, well, then I don't have to have them. I don't have to have God's mercy. I don't have to have the promises that God offers me. I don't have to have them if I don't want them. So heaven is offered to me. Mercy is offered to me. Salvation is offered to me. All I have to do is accept it. So I'm being offered this incredible gift of eternal life. And what I'm asked to do is such a minimum. It's just accept God's mercy. Accept his love. Open my hands and say, I need you. I do not save myself. I'm not good enough for heaven on my own. I need your grace. I need your mercy. I need your help. And the Lord will say, exactly. No problem at all. That's why I died on the cross for you. Because you can't save yourself. It's okay. So the, the, the absolute minimum that we have to do is just simply receive God's mercy. I mean, it, it, it couldn't be easier in a way. So the only obstacle, the only obstacle is me. The only obstacle is how dare you accuse me of, you know, just following my passions and now you're accusing me of, 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 of sinning. The only obstacle here is, is me, my pride. The only obstacle here is me saying, I don't need your mercy. I've done nothing wrong. I heard a, a priest say once, if if everyone just goes to heaven, if we all just live here on earth and, we, and everyone, every single person goes to heaven, why not just be created there? Why didn't God just create us there? Why didn't he just create us in heaven? Why put us through all the bereavement and sickness and disappointment and sadness and exams and taxes and, and cancer and treatment and chemo and stubbed toes and lost fingers in a lawnmower and why put us through all of that for nothing the argument i heard from this priest is that if, if, if god creates us and puts us through all of this for no good reason at all he's a monster just create us in heaven and get us, give, why skip all of that skip all that pain skip just create us up there good to go but but he doesn't in, in God's divine wisdom, he creates us down here in a world where, in a, in a fallen world, in a, in a world where there's sin, in a world where there's pain. And in, in, in all of this somewhat chaos, asks us to set our eyes on heaven, regardless of the, of the storm that we find ourselves in. Set our eyes on heaven. Set our eyes on him. Set our eyes on his kingdom and all the rest. Everything else will be given to us. Set our eyes on him. And, and walk. And choose him. And choose him every day. And receive Receive his love, receive his mercy, receive his gifts. Come to the, approach the altar with, with, with humility, with, with, with great love, with a soul that's ready to receive him, a well-disposed soul. And then receive this incredible gift of the Eucharist. It's, in a way, it's so, it's so easy. It's not completely free, but it's, it's as close to free as it could be. He doesn't want it to be like he doesn't want heaven to be treated treat, treat cheaply, and that's what has happened. What has happened is that heaven is considered free. Now you just oh, what you have to do to get to heaven? Uh, die. That's what you have to do. That's all you have to do. And and it's automatic. And what if you're wrong? What if it's not automatic? What if what if you have to actually do a, a minimum? It's not much, but what if you have to do something to choose heaven? What if you have to actually love God? What if you have to actually try and live a good life? Which, I, on the, again, on the grand scheme of things, it may seem hard while we're here. On the grand scheme of things, living a good life is not hard. Living a sinful life is hard. Waking up with embarrassment and shame and regret and that, that heaviness in your soul that you know you've hurt people and been dis dishonest or unfaithful or drunk or whatever it may be. That, 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 that's, that's, there's no joy in that life. There's no freedom in that. Ask an alcoholic who does exactly what he wants every day, drinking as much as he wants every single day. Ask him if he's happy. Addiction, addic sin doesn't satisfy the soul. It leaves us with, with this, this desire for, for more, but we think that the answer is it, it's, it's more sin. If, if, and if we do more of this thing that I'm, isn't really satisfying me, I'm sure if I do more of it, it'll eventually satisfy me. But it, it doesn't. Because the only thing that will satisfy our soul is, is, 
is he for whom we have been created, God himself. And our hearts are completely restless until they rest in him. So Peter and Paul, they, 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 they lived for this, for this truth, for this reality that, that God was their everything. And that nothing down here mattered as long as they had heaven. And so we would hope that one day we can join our prayer, the prayer at the end of our life, with the words of St. Paul as he writes to Timothy. The time has come for me to be gone. I have fought the good fight to the end. I have run the race to the finish. I have kept the faith. And all there is to come now is the crown of righteousness reserved for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all of those who have longed for his appearing. The Lord stood by me and gave me power so that through me the whole message might be proclaimed for the pagans to hear. And so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from all evil attempts on me and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen.